Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stacey Senate, Program Manager at the National Kidney Foundation serving New England. I would like to thank everyone for joining. As we wait for additional attendees to join the webinar, I will take some time to go over some features you can utilize during our presentation. All attendees have been muted, and for any questions, please use the Q&A window. The Q&A window will allow you to ask questions to the presenters. To locate the Q&A window, hover your mouse over the screen. Click the Q&A tab. Once open, you can type your question into the Q&A box. Click send. The moderator, moderator will then answer your question live after each presentation. We can't promise all questions will be answered due to the time commitment, but we will do our best. Again, thank you for joining this afternoon, and I would like to introduce Chief of Transplant Surgery at BWH, Dr. Tulis. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, um, and welcome uh, to this uh, second part of the Kidney Crossroads uh, event, an interactive event which uh, had been so excellently attended when we had this uh, during the last week. I'm the Chief of Transplant Surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital and also the Director of the Transplant Surgery Research uh, Laboratory. And together with uh, Dr. Schandberger, who is going to moderate uh, today's event, I direct uh, our kidney and pancreas uh, transplant uh, program. This event uh, is um, uh, supported uh, by uh, several sponsors. Um, do I move the slides forward? Stacy, um, thank you. Um, this event is uh, supported by several sponsors, Novartis, Veloxis, uh, Sanofi, and very, very grateful for their support. I also want to um, uh, thank wholeheartedly Stacy Sennett uh, from the um, uh, NKF and uh, Wendy Valerius, uh, the nurse manager um, uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. At Brigham Women's Hospital is really at our heart and uh, uh, our mission to provide excellence in patient uh, care and to provide you all options, both for the treatment uh, of end-stage renal uh, disease and uh, kidney transplantation. And it is therefore important to present to you the complexity of um, uh, information that we have in our area. Uh, we have therefore presentations that cover very different uh, areas from uh, um, clinical research, uh, cutting edge policy, um, uh, relevance of donation, both living and deceased, but also to hear from patients. And I wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Schandrager to you. As mentioned, Dr. Schandrager will moderate uh, this session and he is going to um, present the agenda of today in more detail. Thank you. Thanks, Stanton. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome, everybody. This is part two of our virtual Kidney Crossroads. Um, for those of you who were with us last week, welcome back. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, we got excellent feedback uh, from the first part of this uh, program. And um, if you'd like to see that again, or if you haven't seen it, uh, it is now posted on the BWH Facebook uh, page, uh, under events and you look, just look for kidney uh, crossroads. Today we're going to continue uh, with the second part and we have uh, a number of interesting uh, presentations for you. We're going to start first of all um, with a talk on uh, cutting edge uh, policy and clinical research which will be given by Dr. Joel Adler. Uh, that will be followed by maximizing, maximizing a kidney donation the role of the OPO or the o organ procurement organization which will be given by uh, Samantha Endicott. And then uh, our third talk will be on living kidney donation advances in paired kidney exchange, which will be given uh, by our medical director of uh, kidney donation, Dr. Martino Grath. And then lastly, we will finish with the patient experience and we have uh, both the recipients and the donor who will be joining uh, us to share their experience. After each of the talks, uh, there will be a, a short 10 minute session for you to be able to ask your questions. So think about your questions, uh, send them in uh, on the chat facility or the question and answer facility uh, part of the a button uh, at the bottom of the program and we will go for there. So let's get started. Uh, so our first speaker is Dr. Joel Adler and again he's going to be talking about cutting edge policy and uh, research 
and he is one of our transplant surgeons at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, so thank you, Dr. Shenracker, and of course, Dr. Tullius for the introduction. Um, again, I'm Joel Adler. I'm one of the kidney pancreas transplant surgeons here, also an affiliation with the Center for Surgery and Public Health. A large part of what I'm going to talk about today is how is somewhat recapping part of Dr. Mendu's talk and how this fits into what the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative actually means, but also at the end of the day, how these actually are really very patient-centric and patient-centered ideas and how transplantation as a whole has worked to accomplish those things, as well as how, um, and also some of the clinical and policy research that's going on right here also fits into the big picture. So the, the, I think the easiest way to think about this is to really um, emphasize just how much innovation and experience and everything else that's very exciting about transplant is, has actually been the entire field. And so understanding a little bit of the history and how that all came to be is important to understanding where we are now and then where we hope we'll be within the next five to 10 years. So kidney transplantation by and of its nature is a huge long story and again, a very thoughtful and um, challenging approach taken on by many sorts of all sorts of brave investigators as well as patients to actually um, improve patient outcomes and increase access to care. So the story actually starts way back with Alexis Carell, who was part of it, who actually did run the Nobel Prize for developing the vascular suturing technique and how we use it in organ transplantation, which is still exactly almost the same way we do it today. Peter Medawar was one of the men who figured out, so, who did a lot of the initial work on tolerance and regulation of the immune system, which was a key part in being able to actually do and continue to have long-term graft outcomes and be able to transplant from people who are not identical twins, which we'll talk about in a bit. But then of course, Dr. Murray, who did the first transplant between identical twins of any variety for a kidney here on December 23rd of 1954, I don't know if my mouse actually shows up or not, but I've always loved this picture of the Herrick twins on their way out of the hospital, partially because the style is just perfect for the era in which this was all done, but also because I have the honor and privilege of working in this very building at the Peter Van Brigham Hospital, and my office actually sits in there along close to Dr. Tullius's. And so um, having that sort of history and approach and kind of thought in terms of how we can continue to do things that are really cutting edge and improve outcomes and whatnot for our patients is the, the context in which this talk kind of exists. That's continued all the way through. Dialysis was really developed much more strongly after that. The way that Medicare covered it and so the effects in terms of how people are treated, managed, and then long-term cared for in the United States all came from that. We needed a definition of brain death, improved organ preservation, and ways to improve on tissue typing throughout the years to improve the best long-term, sorry, to ensure the best long-term outcomes that we possibly can. And over the years too, and folks who are on the call have been either transplants or will be receiving transplants or somewhere in that process, the immunosuppression and the way that we've approached that over the years has also dramatically changed, right? We've developed better drugs, it's becoming more specific. We've tried to figure out different ways to minimize the side effects of those. And so again, you'll notice that with that timeline, Every little while, there's big advances in transplant, and that continues to really contribute and impact the way that we practice today. And so that brings us back to a little bit, again, a very, very quick tour through what happened before, but also brings us back to what Dr. Mendu talked a lot about last week, and also the overall theme of this entire Kidney Crossroads is what the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative means, what it means for you, and what are the research and policy initiatives that are supported by this. So as a reminder, the three main goals of AAKH were number one, to reduce the number of Americans developing end-stage renal disease by 25% by 2030. The second goal was having 80% of new ESRD patients by 2025, either receiving dialysis at home or receiving a transplant, which would also be a very big shift. And lastly, doubling the number of kidneys available for transplant by 2030. Now, what Dr. Mendu talked a lot about last week was some of the true policy-driven payment mechanisms and other ways in which that affects how people can do these things. What I'm going to talk about now more specifically is some of the ways in which the government suggested these be accomplished, where that money is going, what that means on the patient level. You'll see some work in terms of and some threads that will match up with what Sam Endicott and then Dr. McGrath are talking about for the OPO and for paired exchange of kidneys and how that all filters down and actually works for everybody. 
So of course, the, the number of suggestions that were proposed were number one, to launch a public awareness campaign to increase the knowledge of CKD. So this talks about screening, education, making sure that people who have the disease are hopefully prevented from ever coming to meet somebody um, for the transplant evaluation to begin with as much as, as well as dialysis. Also talks about reforming the organ procurement and management system to significantly increase the supply. That refers to allocation, that refers to machine preservation, that talks about the way that we work with hospitals to increase organ donation, as well as quite honestly on the living donor side as well, and to make sure that people are able to donate. Expanding support for living donors through the compensation for costs, which is lost wages and childcare expenses. There's a whole lot of work going on um, to be able to find ways to make these donation events what we've termed financially neutral and to make them so that people, while so that our donors who are, are able to donate are, are not left in any way to have to worry about themselves or anything that we can't help them take care of. And one of the more interesting parts of this too is in the trying to encourage the developments of either wearable or implantable artificial kidneys. So also talking about dialysis and how that experience for sure can also be improved for patients. So talking about that last thing first, some of the things that that has is there's a specific part of the AAKH that's meant to be targeted towards the Kidney X Innovation Accelerator. And this is actually a very cool private public partnership between HHS or Health and Human Services and the American Society of Nephrology. And this largely focuses on diagnostics, therapeutics, and really prevention of kidney disease. So aiming kind of one to preventing people from developing it as discussed before to increase that education, but then also with the treatment and how to kind of reimagine dialysis and what that looks like. I've had a number of prize competitions. They're very fancy, they're shiny. They're actually some very cool videos. But one of the things that I always thought was very cool about this project is that there are, there's always been patient involvement in the redesigned dialysis parts, but there's also a very specific part of it directed at patients to come up with the innovations and then have everybody else figure out how to make these happen rather than the other way around, which is much more the typical approach in these sorts of competitions where a bunch of very smart people get together and they come up with some sort of idea that may or may not help patients or may not help it work out. And then we say, hey, patients, do you think this is going to work? Um, there's a very specific part of Kidney X um, that is focused on asking patients, well, how would we actually make this better? Like, what would the hint be? And then actually working backwards from that, dis from that direction. Rather. And it's a very neat and somewhat unique innovation to do so. And like I said, the, the thing about Kidney X is that it largely focuses on kidney transplant, I'm sorry, on kidney disease much more than transplantation per se. Some other things that have come up from renal replacement therapies are the idea of xenotransplantation. This idea has been around for quite some time. That's the idea of an organ that from a non-human into a human, at least for the practice here. This, as you can imagine, is a little bit of a challenge. It, it sounds like a great idea and it continues to be one of those things that is always on the horizon. And we'll see if this ever ends up actually working out. There's been a lot of success in terms of using it into non-human primates, so in the various versions of a monkey, and that the clinical trials are still on the horizon, but may occur. I think ultimately this will, or very easily could one day occur in a very broad statement. Um, the narrowness and its kind of widespread applicability is going to be the question. And if that's ultimately going to be a way that we can actually increase organ supply, or if it is more of a bridge type therapy. And going back towards kidney X, the artificial kidney and the wearing, some of the most advanced work on this, at least right now, is done at the University of California, San Francisco, and at Vanderbilt. Um, working together is meant to be an implantable device. So instead of, so a continuous implantable device that would work as renal replacement therapy that also has received kidney X funding, but similar to Xeno, um, remains a long ways away. So there is a lot of clinical slash, um, so this is policy driven, right? The mechanism is give it is money out of AAKH and other federal funds for a lot of this, but the, um, the clinical applications implications are, are, are huge for patients potentially so. And so that's one way to think about it. Stepping in kind of the middle ground on this and how very, and the great thing about transplantation and one of the reasons I think it's the, the, the best field in medicine and obviously a little biased is that there's so much always going on in terms of innovation and science and research and um, everybody has a role to play in it. And one of the coolest parts is when you start to see those things that are worked on in the lab and in basic immunology really start to make their way towards the clinic. And then thinking about how that then impacts patient outcomes 
um, graph survival, quality of life, et cetera, and how we can be better for everybody. So one of our labs here, this is from Dr. Ozzy's lab. What his lab does, amongst many things, is they're actually be looking at different ways to deal with kind of chronic antibody-mediated rejection, which we think is the, the, the long-term driver of kidney outcomes once we're well down, down the line and dealing with that. Um, what Dr. Ozzy's lab does is work a lot with these, that these <clears throat> excuse me, works a lot with compounds that inhibit what is known as the immunoproteasome and are able to keep organs that would normally be rejected very quickly alive for a very, very long time using some very thoughtful immunoproteasome conditions. Dr. Tullius, who introduced the talk in his lab, works a lot on the idea of age-specific immunity and age-specific immunosuppression. And this actually plays out in a bunch of very cool ways. One thing that we've learned over time is that the immune systems of donors and recipients really vary by age. And learning how to match that and learning how to treat depending on what end of that you're on can actually lead to a more tailored approach to immunosuppression. Um, anybody who's a recipient would know, and hopefully from an education process before him, that the side effects of, immunos of immunosuppression are certainly no, no joke. And um, figuring out ways to very thoughtfully allow the organ to survive, as well as to minimize the chance of infection and other problems for our patients is always at the forefront of our mind. Some other interesting work from Dr. Tullius's lab involves using drugs called senolytics. And what these medications are able to do is to kind of remove the cells that are old within organs and or other parts and allow, once the older cells are gone, to allow the younger and other parts of the organ to both regenerate and to work better. And this actually is very cool research that was just featured at the American Transplant Congress, part of this and others, and received a People's Choice Award. Now, that's a lot of stuff that talks about procedural things that are, sorry, policy that in, uh, led towards innovative work, talks about some of the clinical and translational things that you can get out of that. Last but not least is talking a lot about policy innovation and transplant and how its focus has shifted over the years and what we're trying to accomplish with it. Some of the more recent ones that have made the news, hepatitis C positive donors and hepatitis C negative recipients. Um, this is becoming almost standard now because treating hepatitis C is so good. Hepatitis, sorry, HIV positive donors, to HIV positive recipients required an act of Congress to be able to allow it to happen, but now this happens commonly for all organs and it's very cool. People who with HIV are able to donate, which was not prior to the case. Um, a bunch of innovations in paired kidney exchange through the National Kidney Registry, which Dr. McGrath will talk about. What I'm going to talk about is more the last two items on this list, which is what the updated and changed allocation system might mean and what is being trying to be accomplished by that, and then also different ways to improve the performance of organ procurement organizations, which is something that Sam and McCutt will also touch on. So when I think about policy and transplant, I think a lot about this slide, or at least what we're trying to accomplish. Because the thing that I find most important and always the most interesting about this work is that at the end of the day, what we're doing is taking one organ from another person to improve their quality of life and their length of life. But that system relies on both the recipient, right? That's obvious, but it relies on a donor. And for everybody to think that there's a fair shot or a fair part in the system, you have to believe in this idea of equity on some level. So equality and equity are definitely two different terms. And I, I try to make a very clear distinction between them. And this is the picture I think of. So if you look at the slide, equality is the upper, is that when you give everybody the same kind of base level, which is kind of what the allocation system in kidney does. But here to watch the baseball game, I'm gonna use my three kids as an example. This is Ben. This is Noah and this is Jacob, that's their ages. Ben doesn't actually need that box to see, right? He could have seen just fine. Noah can see with it, but Jacob actually has no opportunity to see the game. And that doesn't actually make any sense from a policy perspective because the idea is to give everybody equal shot at the end outcome, which here of course is a baseball game when we could go to baseball games, but really what we're talking about is transplant. And so, the right way to go about doing this is how do you tweak those disparities and how do you adjust the way in which we think about things, allocate, enroll people, list people, take any version of that that you think is important, and how do we ensure an equitable chance at access, right? Here, all my kids are really happy. Jacob can see, he needed two. Noah needed one, Ben didn't need a thing. And so the idea is that there's different levers that we've been able to pull, a lot on the allocation side, but we're starting to take a bigger step back that will give you an idea of how to access transplantation with 
equity, and not just equality. So this just gets at the idea that I was just talking about, that if we all don't have an equal and fair opportunity at it, that we've actually kind of failed as a system, and therefore we fail to achieve equity. And while that seems like a really big kind of thought to have, um, what you don't really want to think, what you, what you want to realize is that um, by failing to achieve equity that we haven't actually built any trust in the system. So in 2014, the kidney allocation system was initially created. It did a lot of stuff to improve that. We backdated wait time to the dialysis start date. We gave national priority to sensitized recipients and put in some longevity matching. And what's going to happen with the new allocation system is most, or the new boundaries, is that most of the allocation happens within one of these geographic areas. For us in New England, we're up here in the green. There's 12 kidney transplant centers in there. Most of the kidneys stay loosely in that area. What's going to change that's different is that the same bag state allocation structure will exist, but the DSAs will be gone, the donation service areas, and they'll be replaced with 250 nautical mile circles from the donor hospital. And the reason that is being put into place is because all of those DSAs are a little bit different in terms of what kind of patients are able to become donors, organ availability, transplant center behavior, et cetera. And so trying to, trying to even out that chance of being transplanted is what the idea behind that policy is. And this is something that we're starting to work on too in conjunction with New England Donor Services and our OPO. And this idea is meaning is to increase the CSER organ donation by really targeting the donor hospitals themselves. So it's something that we call the HOPS score. And so improving OPO performance, as mentioned before, is a specific goal of advanced American kidney health and the OPO supervises those donation service areas. The OPOs work in and with the different DSAs and try to and have a decent amount of variety in terms of population, donation consent rates, comorbidities, local center practices. And as a consequence of AAKH, the metrics for the OPOs are actually being judged much more aggressively than they were in the past. And so one part of what this work is trying to do, which again is a very kind of interventional aim to match up with policy, is help OPOs work with different donor hospitals, identifying different high performers and low performers and figure out how we can use that data to improve overall the number of transplants, which would also be in line with the overall goals of the advanced American kidney health. So these are some of the details of what we're trying to do, but the basic thoughts are trying to create a risk adjusted way to compare donor hospital performance, which actually hasn't necessarily been done and certainly not be able to do something that we can roll out in a national way. So kidney transplantation remains a really cool thing. And like I said before, this is why I like doing it, I love doing it. And this is why I love thinking about it in all of its different forms. It's a long and storied history, which we went over very, very briefly. We're really good at the operation and a lot of the early parts of transplant, but some of the long-term stuff is, still eludes us, and that's where a lot of clinical and translational research comes in. And the reality is the policies matter, the innovation matters, and that the significant research and clinical innovation is always occurring. The best part about this talk is that um, in a year, when we talk about this again, or in two years, that it would be a completely different talk because the field moves quickly, and at the end of the day, it is ultimately patient-centered and patient-focused to be able to accomplish that. These are the actual kids from the slides from before, um, from when my wife took us off hiking for her birthday, which is kind of a weird thing to do, but it worked out nicely. And I am happy to take any questions. Great, Joel, thank you very much. Um, so it's, you know, we're open for questions. If anybody has questions, please uh, type them in. Um, we'd love to uh, answer them. I'm going to get started uh, while we're waiting for people to put questions in. And you know, one thing that comes up a lot, you know, when you talk to people is this whole question of presumed consent as a way to increase uh, donation. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about what presumed consent is and whether you think it could work in the United States? That's a good question. Um... I think that the, the, so presumed consent is the idea that all people are, have consented to organ donation. So um, from the deceased donor side, normally speaking, you, know, you say yes or no on your driver's license, but that doesn't, depending on some different ways to approach it, that doesn't actually sign you up for the final process. There still is some consent process involved in the family side of that in most situations. And so in many countries, Spain's kind of one of the notable ones that people talk about that consent is actually presumed so that, that by default you're a deceased organ donor. 
Um, I think that it would certainly increase organ donation. I think that there's also some concern that it may not increase it as much as you would think, um, and that the political kind of moves to get up and over that are a little bit challenging. Um, so I think ultimately that is, is where we are. So I think, yes, it would. Um, the magnitude of that is hard to, hard to know in advance. So, uh, okay, great. So I have, we have another question here. Um, so in your opinion, what is the best way to ensure equity in terms of organ transplantation? You know, you talked about that. And hard question, right? And oh, that yes. is, it's a great question and a really important one. Um, I think that the main thing is that, which I, we didn't have a ton of time to talk about here, but that you need to think about transplantation as a whole process, right? You need to think about it way before we even talk about in, entering into the, the referral and evaluation process for transplant. You need to start to get way back to like the things that even lead to kidney disease in general, right? There's a number of things that happen that just kind of happen. You know, they're genetic. There's some sort of immunologic thing that happens because of people's makeup or their health history. But there's a lot of it that gets back to the social determinants of health and just access to healthcare in general. So I think the one thing is that we continue to work on trying to get an idea of what that denominator of people who actually have even chronic kidney disease that are eligible for ultimately transplantation are and where we lose them in the system. Um, but I think all, this is the kind of thing that improved access to healthcare overall means that your chances once you get to that spot in the line is the one kind of straightforward, not straightforward, but like the easiest way to think about fixing it. Um, I, I definitely am also a fan of different ways of thinking about trying to make up some of the missing time towards the end if we have to sort of, you know, in the, in the, you know adding the dialysis wait time back was obviously a huge deal. Um, but then also other groups that would otherwise be disadvantaged or otherwise don't get that process. This is easy to think about in kidney transplant because people end up on dialysis most of the time when there's a process. It's much harder to think about in other organs but just because of the disease processes. And so um, here we are. So there's a question and I'm going to editorialize it a little bit, but it says, uh, any comments about the changes regarding uh, considering race and GFR and not using race in the calculation. Um, you know, I mean, I think it speaks to the larger questions of you know, equity uh, across society. And you know, I mean, clearly everyone realizes that, or maybe I don't know if everybody realizes the much higher rates of kidney failure amongst African-Americans. And how does that affect both listing policies and also donation policies? Because if there's a higher risk of kidney disease in certain minorities, does that affect the uh, likelihood of getting uh, a kidney based on matching, for example, between the recipients? That is a really great point and a really good question too. You know, the, the, the inclusion of race and ethnicity in the race and the GFR, at least in the MDRD and most others, um, is, is one of those things that was, uh, you know, again, you back up 10, 15 years ago when many of these equations were derived, or at least the ones that are more common in any sorts of healthcare, just happens to talk about kidney disease today. And that was a time at which from just a strict analytic perspective that like adjusting for race made a lot of sense. And the thought behind it then was that you would have in a way to measure based off the data you have, and maybe you could change some things on the line. But the problem with adjusting for race is that then it, it, it erases that part of the equation, which is what all the controversy is about now. Because if you adjust for it and you forget about it, as you've pointed out from the ESRD, from the CKD calculators, um, you, you, you don't eliminate the disparities, but you're kind of implicitly saying they're okay. Um, and that's the, that's the large, that's the, the, the kind of the argument about the controversy now. And, and that also even applies to organ donation metrics and transplant center performance stuff. I mean, this, this is pervasive hugely throughout our field. Um, but even through the EGFR part of things, it's a big deal. And especially when you talk about um, qualifying pre-dialysis. So when your GFR falls below 20, um, you see the same problem come up in the equations that we use for liver disease, right? So the MELD actually has the creatinine and renal function attached to it as well. And so people are also kind of disadvantaged from that system. So I think that as we take a hard look at reassessing that and then think about how that impacts donors and recipients, I think that we will find out a lot more about that. It absolutely does. And I also have gotten the sense from centers that have a significantly larger black or African-American population 
from the living donation side, they're a lot more thoughtful and careful about their GFR cutoffs and how they approach that um, in that setting. Daniel, I don't know if you have other comments on that. I mean, that's also going to be interesting in your feelings on as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it is a very complex area. I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, we have really not fully understood, as you alluded to, is the potential for developing uh, kidney disease in living donors and how, you know, genetic uh, abnormalities, you know, we're talking about, you know, there are genetic markers that are associated with increased risk of kidney disease, which are particularly uh, prevalent in uh, the African American population. Um, how do we ensure that we are not putting a donor at risk, which is clearly going to be our first concern? Uh, there, you know, uh, as you're aware, there, there is a, a large uh, effort on the way called the Apollo study, which is looking precisely uh, at that, and I believe you're involved in that as well. Uh, so, you know, I think there's more data to come, but it's clearly not just to do with uh, genetic susceptibility, but it also has to do with socioeconomic uh, uh, factors that affect, you know, people uh, disproportionately if they don't have the same access to health care. Uh, you know, particularly in, in uh, you know, maybe the south of the country and other parts of, of this country uh, where these yeah. disparities are, 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 more, are more obvious. Um, so we have another question. How how's the availability of organs changed in the last five years? Has it increased or decreased? And what are the factors and what are the ways that uh, this has changed, both in terms of deceased and, and living donation? So that's a great question, too. And so the the organ availability has a, a little bit up, I would is my general thing. Now, COVID has certainly, is, this year's numbers are going to look very strange as a result of COVID from the deceased organ and living organ donation side. Um, it has slowly crept up. The, the one thing that a lot of research is on, which I actually didn't even touch on in this conversation, is how to really use more marginal organs, you know, donors that are older, maybe have a little bit lower quality if they're younger. There's all sorts of work going on in terms of machine perfusion, both warm and cold, in an effort to either preserve or even rejuvenate organs, which um, could have easily filled up a good chunk of this talk. It's just not something that I got to, and I suppose I really should have in retrospect, so I'm sorry. Um, but I think that the, the reality is that we haven't really done a great, the, 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 the increase in, the, there's not been a gigantic increase in donors by any stretch, but certainly not falling off either. Um, a couple, a little bit more year over year growth just because people are starting to use more marginal organs, but the number of donors is, is not all that different. Right. Well, John, thank you very much. I mean, uh, you know, it's a very difficult task to ask you to go through uh, you know, and boil down all of this uh, cutting edge research and, and uh, policy and the interaction between the two in, in such a short time, but uh, we really appreciate that. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if people have questions, uh, you know, you can send them to us. We'll be happy to respond to you even after the, uh, the webinar. So uh, uh, thanks very much, Joel. So moving along, uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Samantha Endicott, and she's going to talk about uh, maximizing uh, um, organ availability from an organ procurement organization uh, or OPO uh, uh, point of view. So, um, and she's from the uh, New England Donor Service, previously called New England Organ Bank. And this is an organization uh, that is responsible for making sure that the organs that become available uh, from deceased donors uh, are uh, uh, distributed to the transplant centers. All right, can you see my screen? Okay, hi everyone, sorry about that. Um, my name is Samantha Endicott and uh, I am a regional director at New England Donor Services, which is an OPO, which you have probably been hearing a lot about and might not really have a, a great understanding of, of what that means and, and what we do because we're certainly not as visible as a lot of other um, portions of the transplant process that you would interact with more regularly. 
So I hope to give you a little bit of a glimpse of the work that we do and um, answer any questions you have at the end. So an OPO, just to talk about the basics, is uh, an organ procurement organization. And so there are um, many in the country, but here in New England, we are lucky to have um, one organ procurement organization, New England Donor Services, that's able to serve multiple states and um, multiple transplant centers. So 14 transplant centers and 34 transplant programs and almost 200 acute care hospitals for which we retain responsibility for maximizing donation. Um, and I think uh, important to note that we are actually two organ procurement organizations under one umbrella organization. So as was um, mentioned in the introduction, we are formerly New England Organ Bank. And there was another OPO, a smaller OPO in the Hartford area uh, called Life Choice Donor Services. And in 2017, we affiliated, brought our two OPOs under one umbrella where the same staff, the same processes, um, trying to kind of really optimize performance among both of our OPOs um, came together in 2017 and, and really with great results. And so I'm going to share a little bit about that with you. Um, but I think most importantly, no matter, you know, where you are in the country, there is an organ procurement organization. And if you look on our websites, we've all got really similar missions and visions. And our entire job and, and what we're passionate about is saving and healing lives through organ and tissue donation. So for those of you who are here, uh, on this call today that are providers, those of you that are patients, please know that every day we come to work with the goal of, of getting organs um, so that you're able to be transplanted or your patients are able to be transplanted. And there's a lot of different ways that we go about trying to make that happen, um, some of which Dr. Adler touched on and I'll go a little bit further into, um, but having effective relationships with hospitals, working with the transplant centers, making sure that we're serving donor families in a way that their experience is positive and, and we're giving them a, a legacy for their loved ones. Um, and so there's uh, a lot to what we do and it's mostly behind the scenes. And, and so um, I hope you'll be able to leave this talk understanding a little bit more about our work. So um, Dr. Adler actually had a, a better map than I do of this, but when we talk about organ procurement organizations and, you know, me saying that there's many across the country, um, this is a map of, of the OPOs across the country. And so each color is an independent um, OPO. And what's important to note about this um, and was, you know, similar on Dr. Adler's map is the fact that these are not consistent. Um, you know, there's some, so New Mexico, they cover all the hospitals in that state. But then you look at a place like Texas and there's three different colors here and they're not even contiguous. And so that comes into play with allocation policy, or at least it has in the past and we're working toward going away from that. Because if you are in this light green in Texas and an organ becomes available in the dark green area of Texas, previously you weren't the first one up for that organ, even if you were sicker, because everything was based on um, geography a little bit, you know, certainly illness and need and everything else, but geography had a big part to play in how organs were allocated. And that's a problem. So this is actually an, an excerpt from the uh, federal guidelines that are um, over organ donation. And, you know, there's a lot to it. Obviously, this is a complex system. But what I want to bring to your attention, and again, Dr. Adler touched on this, is um, the way that geography currently plays a role in organ allocation. And, and there's actually um, a policy around organ allocation, a federal policy that is known as the final rule. And it specifically states that someone's uh, organ availability or the way that organs are allocated cannot be based on the candidate's place of residence or place of listing, unless it's because you know, you're so far away that the organ is not going to be viable by the time it gets to you or things like that. And so it's really important that um, we take a look at those allocation policies and update them so that they are more equitable. Um, and so just to give you an example of what that looks like. So even though there's different OPOs in these regions, we do have, you know, the UNOS, um, the national group does uh, divide the country up into regions. And so you can kind of see the different regions across the country. We here in New England are region one and New England donor services serves almost every hospital in region one. So if you're in region five and you need a heart and you get listed, your wait time, and, and this is a little bit of older data now that allocations changed, we hope that these numbers are different, but this is why allocation changed, is that if you were in region five, you would wait about 47 days. Um, if you were in 
these regions, you can see 56 to 72 days. Then some of these other regions, 86, 94, you know, we're getting to, you know, there's a big difference between 47 days and 121 days. Um, and what I think is really unacceptable is that if you were in region one waiting for a heart a few years ago, you were waiting, what, four times, five times, six times the number of, of days that someone in region five is waiting for a heart. And so that was a really stark reminder of how geography, despite being specifically banned from impacting allocation, has been impacting allocation. And so um, through a lot of discussion over the years, through uh, unfortunately lawsuits, um, allocation certainly in the last three years has changed dramatically to try to address this inequality that exists just based on geography, let alone all the other things that can impact um, and, and cause disparities. So in 2017, in uh, right around Thanksgiving, uh, lung allocation changed. And it was similar to what Dr. Adler was describing. They started with, if you are somebody um, that needs a set of lungs and say you're in New York, we're going to look in a circle 250 nautical miles round. And any, any hospital, no matter which OPO, no matter which service area you're in, you should have access, equal access to those organs, because that's maybe our first window of viability for those lungs. And if there's not a suitable recipient in that area, then we're going to go out further. But really trying to make it more equitable and not based on these arbitrary maps that are drawn based on where an OPO covers. Heart allocation in 2018 made a similar move. They used a bigger circle based on uh, data that they had around viability and everything else. And so they're starting with a 500 nautical mile. Um, so if you're, say, um, a, a donor at Mass General, someone in Ohio might be the first patient on the list if they're the sickest patient and they're within that 500 nautical mile band. And again, it's all about trying to get the sickest patients transplanted, limit deaths on the wait list. Um, and so, sorry, I'm just going to go back one. So those two changes have been made. Liver allocation actually changed in April of this year, and kidney allocation will be changing, um, as Dr. Adler um, pointed out. And so that's kind of the first step in, in trying to maximize availability of organs, is making sure that they're going to the right patients, that we're getting people transplanted when you know, they truly need it and not you know, transplanting someone just because they're closer to the donor hospital. Um, I do wanna just be very clear that when I talk about donors, I'm speaking um, exclusively about deceased organ donors. And so these are patients who um, present to a hospital in extremis and for some reason. So maybe they were in a car accident or um, you know, suffered a gunshot wound or, or had some kind of trauma or other uh, injury to their brain that is non-survivable. And in those cases, when the patient, um, after their death, uh, is able to be a donor of, of many organs, certainly kidneys, but we try to allocate as many organs as possible to maximize the number of patients' health. So when we talk about the changes that are going on federally with trying to optimize donation, we absolutely support that work. We want, I mean, I showed you our mission and our vision. Our, our mission is to get everyone that needs a transplant, a transplantable organ. And so we are completely supportive of that work, but I think it's also really important how we accomplish maximizing um, those organs because there's a number of ways to do it. And while we want innovation and we want strategy and we want to think outside the box, we cannot afford to take any steps that, that drop us lower in the number of organs available. So we can't try something that is actually going to lower donation because every organ that we don't transplant is, is someone's life. Um, and that's the way we view it. And so for our organization, New England Donor Services, we look at it as our mission every day is to figure out what we can do to have more donors. And we don't necessarily look at it as comparing ourselves to other OPOs because as was pointed out, every OPO serves a different patient population. Um, I'm from a state that had one level, level one trauma center in the entire state. And so your risk of dying in a car accident or you know, of some other injury that because of poor trauma care was much higher. And so there, there were more organs available for transplant, but that was because a lot of patients were dying in a way um, that you know, if they had more access to healthcare, they may not have died. And so here in New England, we're blessed with really great healthcare, but that means that a lot of those lives that in other places may become donors um, are patients whose lives are saved, which is a great thing. And so we have to maximize every opportunity that does present itself in New England. And so our, our strategies that we work toward every day 
are to increase authorization because if a family says no to donation, then we've lost possibly eight opportunities for transplantation. We want to increase utilization. When we do have a donor, how can we make sure that every possible organ is transplanted successfully? And then creating a culture of donation because if we're talking to a family on the worst day of their life and they've never heard anything about donation, it's that much harder for them to understand that this is a decision that's actually going to help them in the future. So if they come into it with a baseline knowledge, um, we have that much better chance of success. And so we want to create that culture. And, and I want to tell you that I'm able to speak about these strategies um, in a way that I feel pretty qualified because I work for New England Donor Services. So this is actually an article that was on the UNOS website. This woman is actually the CEO of our organization. And she and our organization have a track record of being able to increase donation. Because that affiliation that I talked to you about uh, back in 2017, when we affiliated with Life Choice Donor Services, we worked with them to really change their practices to more um, match what we've been doing in, in New England Organ Bank in terms of, you know, having specialized counselors talk to families, having great relationships with the hospitals, um, working with centers to do research and things that are going to make more opportunities for donation. And so in 2017, we affiliated with Life Choice. And a year later, they had a 95% increase in the number of donors and a 93% increase in the number of organs that were transplanted from those donors. So we have a track record in New England, and it's something that we just continue to work toward every day. Um, and, and I'm going to show you a little bit about what we're doing. So when we talk about increasing authorization, um, we really start with these principles that we're going to offer every potential donor family that opportunity to give the gift of life. We're not going to make any assumptions based on their race, based on their culture, based on their religion based on their emotion. Um, we're going to make sure that they have the opportunity. Um, we're going to honor and respect the wishes of patients who've made a donation decision already. So if you put it on your license that you want to be a donor, it's my job to make that a reality um, and to work with your family to make that a reality. And then to have the best donation discussion possible with every family. There's families that, unfortunately, it's just not the right decision for them. And if that's the case, we still want them to walk away from that conversation with a positive view of our organization and of donation as a whole. Um, and so we, we carry that with us every day. And part of having, that, having those principles be met is what we call the collaborative donation process. So we work with the hospitals to make sure that they are calling us about potential donor patients in a timely way. When they call us, we're going to go to the hospital and we're going to work with the team and talk about, you know, how's this family doing? What can we do for this family to have them, you know, really feel cared for so that when we talk to them, you know, they're really in a place to think about organ donation in a, in a way that is, you know, less driven by their circumstances and more about their beliefs and values. And then whatever we decide for a plan of when we're going to talk to the family, how we're going to speak to them, you know, all of that, we want to make sure we follow that plan. And so this seems like a really simple thing, right? It's basically make a plan, follow the plan. But in it is really the key to success. And we've seen that over the past few years. Um, and so you can see our authorization rate as an organization. And these are small numbers in terms of the percentages. But each percentage represents up to 50 to 100 organs that additional organs that can be transplanted. And so for us, even a 1% increase in donation and 1% increase in authorization is that many more organs available for transplant. And so our goal um, for this year is to hit 70%. And unfortunately, COVID has certainly presented a challenge with that, but we are um, still steady on toward that goal for this year. Um, the other uh, second piece of what we're doing to try to increase donation is to increase utilization. And so um, you may have seen in the news um, a lot of stories about the increase in opioid overdoses across the country, but certainly here in New England, we were um, hit early uh, and have continued to be hit with this epidemic. Um, I feel like almost everyone knows someone who's struggling with this or has lost someone to this um, really devastating disease. And so for us, we view this as um, something horrible that's happening to our community as all these patients that many of which are lost very young. But what we feel we can offer to these families is an opportunity for that patient to, to live on in some way, and that's through organ donation. Um, these patients do have a higher risk of, of, you know, having diseases transmitted from, you know, drug use. And so making sure that we're still pursuing those opportunities as well as making sure that we're pursuing opportunities for organ preservation. Uh, so with Dr. Adler, he set me up nicely. He touched on a lot of the things I was going to mention. So um, when we talk about using, you know, there's a lot of people that say, oh, they use 
IV drugs, they're not going to be a candidate for donation. And that is just completely untrue. You know, as was mentioned earlier, hep C positive donors can donate to hep C negative recipients. Um, HIV positive organs can be transplanted. But I think the other piece that's really important to notice is that the odds of um, someone actually having an infection with one of these diseases that we're not going to detect, so we're going to know about this. It's not a risk of getting a transplant and then all of a sudden catching a disease you weren't expecting. We are able to um, test these donors in a way that it's about a seven-day window period for almost all the diseases that we test for so that they will expect and know to treat. You know, if, if someone catches hep C from a transplant, there's effective treatments for that. And the risk of catching HIV from a transplant where the testing was negative and then someone catches the disease is less than a tenth of a percent. And so this is actually very safe given the testing that we can do for donors. And so educating recipients to know that it might be worth accepting a high risk donor because the benefit of having that transplant much outweighs the risk of uh, contracting a disease with the quality of testing that we have for donors. Um, and you can see that we've maximized the use of uh, these donors and I'm sorry, over the years, and we continue to do so, although in 2020, obviously with COVID, we've had um, some decline there. Oops, somehow, there we go. Um, and then finally, organ preservation. Um, as was mentioned, we wanna be able to take an organ and maybe there's not a local recipient. Is there someone further out that could use this organ? Or maybe this organ, the donor is very sick and the organ's not functioning well in that body. Can we put it on a pump and, and have it perform better so that the recipient gets an organ of better quality? And so we've been doing this with kidneys for probably 30 years with the ex vivo perfusion. Um, so out of the body, putting it onto a machine and optimizing its function. And so if it's been working so well for kidneys, why aren't we doing it with other organs? And the answer is that we're starting to. Um, so this is the heart in a box, this is the lung in a box, but it's all the same principle that we're going to preserve this organ, we're going to be able to travel with this organ, we're going to be able to possibly improve the function of this organ and make or more organs available for transplant. And then I just want to end with what I talked about, creating a culture of donation. And so our organization has done a lot. We started uh, within the last few years, we've added a community outreach department um, our Facebook, our Twitter, you know, all of these things over the past few years have been a huge priority to try to get our message out into the community. And, and many of you on this call are part of that because recipients sharing their stories, even patients that are waiting, sharing their stories, puts a face to what we do and makes it that much um, easier for a family in, in that time where they have to make a decision to really understand the impact of, of what a yes to donation can mean. And so we've been trying to outreach to various communities and honestly, just trying to help people understand what we are and, and what we do. And so I'll just end by saying that, you know, we, we feel like we've got some strategies that are working. And so we absolutely support the national efforts to improve um, performance of OPOs. But we just need to make sure that any rules that are put in place, you know, the teeth that are coming um, to these regulations, we need to make sure that um, they don't come at the expense of the current success that we're having. And so I just want to say thank you to all of you. And at this point, I'll answer any questions. So great. Thank you very much, Samantha. Um, of course. So I, we, we have questions coming through already. Um, so one question um, I have is, what precautions are in place to ensure that donated organs are safe during coronavirus? It's a great question and one that we've kind of probably along with the transplant centers had to learn on the fly. So. Um, we are testing every potential donor for COVID. Um, most donors are getting tested at least twice, um, but we are following the uh, Association for uh, Transplant, American Society of Transplantation guidelines, where we screen the donors, ensure that they have testing that is within uh, three days of the donation. We're screening them for symptoms um, and uh, any travel, all of those different things um, to make sure that uh, these patients are, are negative prior to those organs being recovered for transplant. Right, and I believe there hasn't been any transmission of coronavirus through donation. No known transmissions from donation. Absolutely, great, thank you. Um, and so what do you think the general public can do and what role can they play in helping increase uh, donation rates? I think there's a few things. Um, certainly, if you are not already registered to be a donor, getting registered is the, the best thing you can do, not making any assumptions about your um, medical suitability for that. You know, patients who are 
have received a transplant, patients that are waiting for a transplant, um, can still be organ donors. Uh, older patients, younger patients, there's really very little in the way uh, we recover organs up to the 86th birthday. So really would encourage everyone to register and certainly would encourage anyone who's involved with transplantation, again, wait list, recipients, anyone who's been touched or impacted by transplantation to share their story. Because again, our success in the hospitals with talking to these families really hinges on what they know about donation. It is not at all uncommon for us to go to meet with a family and for them to raise donation because they saw something on the internet or they have someone at their church that's waiting for a kidney. And so sharing your story as much as possible really can make a difference um, on a day-to-day -day when we're meeting with families about donation. And, and I know that you guys go out and about in the community and you know, uh, uh, you know spread the word. And uh, I guess you're also available if people want to invite you to their uh, churches and other places and to spread the word, is that correct? Absolutely, so we have an entire department who that's their entire role. It's funny, I, I met with a couple of them the other day and one of them had just zoomed into a church uh, gathering to talk about donations. So we absolutely um, can email us on our, or go to our website and we, we go to schools. We have actually a volunteer coordinator who we have recipients and donor families that volunteer with us and so they go to schools and programs and um, so yeah, there's any opportunity we can take to get the word out, we're very happy to participate. There's one question that's come through and I'm not sure how much it applies, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, under the new allocation system, what factors will be considered to determine that one patient is sicker than the next. Now, usually uh, allocation for kidneys is, is based on wait time and degree of sensitization, and that would seem to apply more to the other organs. Can you explain the difference in allocation between different organs? Absolutely. So with kidneys, you know, they're kind of basically everybody's pretty equally sick on dialysis because there's a therapy that will help you remain on the wait list. Um, whereas, you know, if you need a lung transplant, we don't have good therapies for patients who need a lung transplant. And so um, they actually have individual scores for each organ that are taken into consideration medical factors. So for lungs, it's called the lung allocation score. For the liver, it's called the model for end-stage liver disease score. And it looks at a patient's lab results. It looks at, are they in the hospital? Are they requiring certain medications? Um, and it really paints a picture, and of course nothing's perfect, but it does try to paint a picture of survival because, you know, someone who needs a heart might have a very limited amount of time, and unfortunately, you know, weightless mortality is, is a reality, and so those scores for certainly the other organs try to predict that and prevent it as much as possible. Right, and I think there's a similar question which is saying, what is the formulation to determine priority? And I think you really answered it. Maybe I can say a few words and maybe you can then uh, add, add something to it. So but for, for kidney allocation, it is it's based on a point system. Most of the points are allocated according to the number of days that you've been on the wait list. And your time on the wait list starts either when you start dialysis or when your kidney function dips below a certain level, even if you are not on dialysis, as long as you have been seen and evaluated at a, at a transplant center. But you also get points for other things if you're completely matched or if you're highly sensitized and have a lot of antibodies against potential donors, which would mean that you have less potential for accepting kidneys, you get uh, points for that. And so you get boosted up the, the system. So, so basically, but the, but the vast majority of people is based on, on the amount of waiting time is, is that correct? Is there anything else you want to add to that? The only thing I would add is that the whole system is trying to, A, prevent mortality, and B, optimize the use of these organs. And so how you're saying, you know, what you said about if you're a perfect match, you might show up higher on the list is because you have the best chance of that kidney being a successful transplant that you would get one transplant and have it for the rest of your life. And so the list is really designed to prevent mortality and certainly that is higher for the other organs, but also have the best outcome at, at all possible for the, the recipient. And so that's more on the kidney list, what they're looking for is the best possible outcome for those recipients. So, um, so I have a question here. So this is something that came up in a um, couple of weeks ago for us, is um, we got um, a, something called a directed donation. 
I know that a lot of patients aren't familiar with that. Would you like to say a few words about what that is? And Absolutely. So when we talk to families about organ donation um, in the hospital, one of the things that we talk to them about is directed donation. So when we talk to them about this life-saving gift, we ask them whether they know anyone that needs a transplant. And often that's, you know, trying to help them, again, put, put a face to the name, trying to really understand what this gift means. But if a family says to us, oh, yeah, my uncle is waiting for a kidney, um, we can actually ask them if they would like to direct the gift to that person. And so if they say, oh, can my uncle have this kidney? Or, you know, they say, oh, I know someone at church that needs a kidney. Um, they can actually provide to us the name of that patient and where they're listed. And we will contact that transplant center. And if that transplant center thinks that that kidney is a good match for their recipient, um, it will be allocated to that person based on the family's wishes rather than going through the waitlist system as was just discussed. So instead of having to have the point system, it's really a directed gift from that family. And so that's kind of another sometimes really magical benefit of sharing your story is that someone might want to help. And, and we have had, you, you've seen probably news stories, we've had it happen very many times where someone, you know, that they work with or from their church or a relative um, can get their kidney or other organs. We'll do it for any organ, but the chances of matching for the kidney seem to be a bit better than all the other um, things that happen for the other organs. And um, so uh, along those lines, so you've talked a little bit about uh, brain dead donors. There's been uh, increasing interest in donation after cardiac death, um, which I think most people are familiar with, but can you talk a little bit more about that and what is the uh, New England Donor Services uh, doing to encourage that? Absolutely. So um, DCD or donation after cardiac death or circulatory death um, is someone who really, the referrals are all the same, right? Somebody who's got some kind of devastating injury, but it's about 1% of the population that dies of brain death. And so if we only took organs from brain dead donors, the shortage of organs would be even greater than what it is now. And so um, in a place like New England where there's great trauma care, if you get brain injured, there's a lot of great places that are going to do a lot of things to save your life. And there's, unfortunately, not everyone is going to recover the level of function that's acceptable to them. So there's a lot of patients and families that would say they wouldn't want to live on machines. You know, we're actually going to make the loving decision to, to take the machines away. And those patients can be evaluated for DCD because they are not brain dead. They still got some neurological function, but it might just be as little as taking occasional breaths, and they would have to be on machines their entire life, and, and that's not what they or their family wanted for them. And so in those cases, the family decides to withdraw the ventilator, and we have a surgical team available to recover those organs, again, after the patient dies. All of this always happens after a patient is deceased. Um, and there's data to support that the, the function of certainly kidneys for those patients is the same at one year in terms of outcomes as a brain dead donor. And so for us, it's really important that we maximize the use of, of that type of donation. And our local transplant centers are great about accepting those organs. And so when you run the data nationally about DCD, New England Donor Services is consistently in the top 10% of OPOs using these types of donation. And it's actually anywhere from 20 to 30% of our donors in any given year uh, are DCD donors. So we definitely take every opportunity. And now, you know, Probably 10 years ago, the only organs we would recover under DCD circumstances were kidneys. And now um, we uh, had the second DCD heart donor in the country. And now we've done several of them. So every organ can be recovered under DCD circumstances now as well, which is also maximizing those opportunities for transplant. That's great. And I think just we'll, we'll end up with the last question. Um, if a person has survived cancer, is the requirement of five years remission for an organ to be procured as a deceased donor? It really depends on the type of cancer. Um, so for something like breast cancer, um, you know, some of these more aggressive cancers, it might even be something like 10 years. Um, so it really depends on the individual cancer and the treatment and, you know, any evidence of recurrence and all the follow-up. And so what we tell everyone is to just not rule yourself out, you know, sign up to be a donor and we will do that homework. Um, I've just was discussing a case this morning of a patient who had cervical cancer um, a few years ago, and we absolutely transplanted organs from that donor. And so um, it, you absolutely can be a donor after recovering from cancer, but the timeline for, for how long out you need to be may vary by, by that type of cancer. So something we can evaluate at, at, at someone's 
when they come to be a donor. Right, and and you know, donors, um, you know, just it's not just about uh, organ donations, but tissue donation. There are so many different donations Absolutely. that can occur from an individual donor, and some may be affected, and others not by the history of cancer. And and that's a great point because even someone with current metastatic cancer. Um, can donate corneas at the time of their death because that's a vascular and can restore sight to two people. And so it's really an amazing gift to make regardless. Um, and again, I would point out that I'm speaking exclusively about deceased donation. The rules around living donation and time away from a cancer diagnosis would need to be determined by your transplant center. Absolutely. Thank you. So Samantha, thank you very much. That's very educational. Thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, and that was a great talk. Uh, so Great, and maybe one day we'll Thanks for having come me. back and uh, have, a, have a, another session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, bye -bye. So uh, moving on, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Martina McGrath. Uh, she is the medical director of the uh, Living Donor Program at the Brigham Women's Hospital. She's also a transplant nephrologist, and she's going to talk about um, uh, Head exchange donation um, and advances that have been made in this area. Thank you, Anil, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, and thank you all for for staying staying um, through these whole sessions. Um, my talk is really going to segue very nicely from both what Joel and um, and um, our Samantha spoke about a few minutes ago. And I'm going to focus mainly on living kidney donation. I'm going to give an overview on why we do living kidney donation and the benefits of it. And then also um, give you a little bit of background on our particular program and um, some, some specific features of that. So we'll talk about the benefits of live donation. I'll go through a brief overview of our process to evaluate our live um, kidney donors. And then I'm going to focus on kidney exchange programs, which have been mentioned a couple of times today, and talk a little bit about the benefits to donors of participating in one of these exchange programs, because I think this is a very significant advance that has come um, in live donation over the past couple of years. So why do we want to try to get our patients live donors, live donor kidneys. And the, the first thing I should say is that any kidney transplant is preferable to remaining on dialysis. And if a patient does not have access to a live donor kidney, a deceased donor kidney is an excellent option and increases their life expectancy and their quality of life as compared with remaining on dialysis. However, if there is an option to have a live donor kidney, there are a number of benefits. First of all, it may be possible to get transplanted much more quickly because we're not talking about the wait time and a lucky proportion of patients will be able to avoid dialysis entirely and there are significant long-term health benefits to that. Live kidneys tend to last longer than deceased donor kidneys. They tend to work better and have higher GFR or glomerular filtration rate. Because this is a planned surgery and it's a kidney that's coming from a live donor, there are much lower rates of delayed graft function, which means the kidney tends to work immediately um, once it's placed in the recipient. And this means that the, the surgery is a little less complex, but the recovery post-operatively tends to be much faster and patients spend less time in hospital if they have a live donor kidney. And also there are significant advantages in terms of flexibility. And we'll talk about options such as exchange programs and advanced donation um, if someone has a live donor available. So just to um, highlight this, if we look at um, the long-term survival of a kidney transplant, a deceased donor kidney on average lasts somewhere around 15 years um, today, whereas a live donor kidney, about 50% of them will still be functioning well over 20 years, maybe 25 years post-transplant. So particularly for um, those patients that are younger um, when they come to end-stage kidney disease, getting a good live donor kidney may last them a very long number of years, and we hope that may be the only transplant that they would need in their lifetime. Again, when you talk about the timing of transplant, those who are able to be transplanted early or before they even go on to dialysis tend to have longer, um, 
longer long-term transplant survival than those who have been on dialysis for a number of years. There are several reasons why this can happen. Um, dialysis itself is an imperfect treatment and people can accumulate more and more comorbidity while they're on dialysis, as well as um, changes in their immune system from long-term end-stage kidney disease. So the earlier that we can transplant patients, the better we expect that transplant to function in the longer term. A lot of my work as a medical director of life donation is thinking about how can we safely do this process where we can get as many patients transplanted with high quality kidneys as possible, but bearing in mind donor safety as our primary concern. So the um, consortium group um, called KDGO, which is Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, has come up with a, a schematic outline as to how we think about uh, kidney donors and a number of guidelines in terms of assessing their kidney function and how we select them appropriately. So the suggestion here is that all patients should have their kidney function tested um, with an initial screening test, um, such as a blood test using um, creatinine to estimate glomerular filtration rate, and those that have low GFR are um, automatically excluded. Those that have normal GFR or those in a more um, intermediate range of 60 to 90 need to undergo more detailed testing to make sure that the initial testing is correct and to um, evaluate for consistency. And then again, you see where they come in in terms of GFR. Those who have a GFR over 90 are considered excellent transplant uh, donor candidates um, and would be considered to have a lower long-term risk um, if they have donated a kidney. And when we look at those patients in the more intermediate category of GFR, there are many factors that are considered um, in terms of whether or not they can be a suitable donor. It's much more than I can get into today, but what I would say is, um, this commonly is a discussion between the transplant center, the donor, and what the recipient needs can also become a factor in terms of figuring out, is it possible to safely do this transplant? A primary concern of ours is, as I said, long-term safety of donors. And in recent years, it has been shown that patients who have donated a kidney in the past are, um, are at higher risk of developing end-stage kidney disease themselves than if they had not donated. So this was a retrospective um, study from 2014 where they looked at 96,000 patients who had donated and compared them to 96,000 healthy control patients. So these control patients were carefully selected in that they should have been sufficiently healthy that they could have been donors themselves. And then in 15 year follow-up, they looked at um, rates of end-stage kidney disease in both groups and essentially showed that there is a significant increase in end-stage kidney disease in live donors. If we go into this in a bit more detail, this really translates into a lifetime end-stage kidney disease risk by age of 80 years of 90 per 10,000 in live donors as compared with about 14 per 10,000 in healthy non-donors. What I would point out to you is that this is still significantly lower than the rates of end-stage kidney disease we see in the general population, 326 per 10,000. That is because donors are inherently healthy people and because we exclude um, people that have significant disease or you know, have obvious risk factors for kidney disease. And subsequent studies have shown that this is not uniform across all donors. So what I would say is that um, unfortunately, patients who are of black race who donate have been shown to have higher risk of end-stage kidney disease. Um, people who are younger um, who donate have higher risk of end-stage kidney disease simply because they have more years of life where they could run into a problem. And much of this data has really informed our thinking and the way we manage donors um, in the past couple of years. And I think um, both Anil and Joel have already alluded to um, some work that's being done and looking at genetic risk um, for, a, for kidney disease in African-American populations, um, looking at the APOL1 gene and if this is a risk factor for negative outcomes after donation, this is something that we certainly are um, doing a lot of work on and considering very carefully in evaluating our donors. Other complications that can arise, so there's a higher risk of high blood pressure after donation, 
And because patients have a reduction in their GFR because they've lost a kidney, they, um, more donors will reach that lower threshold of a GFR under 60 mils per minute um, than if they had done, not donated. So about a third of donors um, will have a GFR less than 60 mils per minute by 20 years post donation. One of the big, I think, unknowns in this area is what does that actually mean? Um, because I think we can all agree that someone who has a GFR of less than 60 mils per minute because they have diabetes is very different than a patient who has a GFR of less than 60 mils per minute because they have donated away 20 or 30 mils of their GFR. So I think these donors that have uh, lower GFR need to be carefully screened and followed, but we do not have the data that this is associated with very high risks of negative outcomes um, that it may be in other conditions. Um, one other important area that we um, discuss carefully, particularly with our, our young women who want to donate, is um, the, the associated increased risks of complications in pregnancy. Um, after donations, there are slightly higher rates of gestational hypertension and preeclampsia in women who have donated before. Um, many women who have been donors have had successful pregnancies. Um, several of the original twin pairs that were done at the Brigham were in young women um, who had many pregnancies afterwards but we do um, discuss this again carefully with our donors so everyone's fully informed before they choose to go ahead. So what is our protocol at the Brigham? Um, so essentially a donor needs to come to us. Um, so the donor contact us either online or by telephone and then completes a pretty detailed online donor intake form that covers a lot of their medical, social and family history. This is aimed at getting a sense of what their general health is like and what their future risk of developing kidney disease is like. So then one of our donor transplant coordinators will call the patient and go through that form. We'll look for any major red flags that might suggest this person could not um, safely donate. And then we'll start to do a basic laboratory workup um, to get a better sense of could this donor um, successfully go ahead. We have a very long list of absolute contraindications. These are just some of the biggest ones. Um, those who are very young, if someone obviously has reduced GFR, any evidence of kidney disease themselves, or important risk factors for kidney disease, such as high blood pressure or diabetes, we generally say they're not suitable to donate. We have an even longer list of relative contraindications, and these are um, factors in someone's family or medical or his family or medical history that means they might be at slightly higher risk of donating we look at these factors and discuss them and um, you know again if someone has one of these issues it may not be a problem if they have several we may say no these all add up and makes too much risk some of it will also depend on the particular situation so if we have um, someone who wishes to donate to a recipient who is highly sensitized and has no option to get another transplant, we may have more careful discussions about the risks and is this possible to go ahead. If we have someone who um, is very young and has a couple of these relative contraindications, then we would be reluctant to take them as a donor. So what I would say is that when we look at these factors, we look both at the donor, but also the family or the person that they wish to donate to and try and come up with an equitable solution for everyone that avoids placing too much risk on any of our donors. This is a basic workup that we do. So we look at kidney function, um, screening for diabetes and basic labs, including tissue typing to check for matching. And then when someone comes on their evaluation day and um, they get some radiological tests and we also do some basic tests for age appropriate cancer screening um, as outlined here. On the day that someone comes to the Brigham for their donor evaluation, they will meet myself or one of my colleagues where we go through the medical evaluation, we think about their future risk of kidney disease, and then we spend a long time talking to them about how donating might change their long term health if we think it, it could and what, what that might look like. And they also meet with transplant surgery or urology to talk about the surgery in itself and the risks and benefits there. They'll meet with a social worker, a financial coordinator, and also an independent donor advocate. So the independent donor advocate is someone who is not part of um, the transplant program per se, but works with us in the, in the live donor program who speaks entirely on behalf of the live donor. 
um, and can, if there are any issues or concerns, we'll advocate for them. So when we talk about options for kidney donation, um, I think everyone's familiar with the straightforward um, donation that I'm showing here, where a donor comes forward and they wish to donate to a recipient. And this is traditionally how live kidney donation was done. But we have many other ways of doing this um, in recent years that I'd like to spend um, the next few minutes talking about. So obviously a donor can be related to you. Um, it can be a family member or it can be an unrelated donor, um, friend, um, a spouse, a work colleague. These are all possible to donate. Um, and this is where um, the donor is compatible with the recipient, where they may be of the same blood type or there are, there are no um, anti-HLA antibodies that are a barrier. We also get um, a, a large number of non-directed donors. And these are people who come forward and they say, I have two kidneys. There are so many people who need a kidney, I would like to give one. Um, so we are very fortunate to be able to work with these, these wonderful people and try to find the best use of that gift that they give to us. Um, I'll talk a little bit about incompatible pairs. That's where someone would like to donate to a friend or family member, but they cannot because they're not a match and how we handle that to try and make that transplant go ahead. And then something I think that not so many people are aware of is this option of advanced donation. Um, so we'll spend a minute or two discussing that. So in a kidney exchange program, if we have a donor and a recipient pair that are not a match, and we have another donor and recipient pair that are not a match, in the most simple form of a kidney exchange, donor two, who mat is a match with recipient one, will donate to them. And donor one, who is a, a match to recipient two, will donate to them. So everybody gets transplanted, everybody donates, but not to the person that they came with. These, this is, so as I said, this is the original kidney exchange. This has gotten much more sophisticated and complicated in recent years. And we've now begun to do um, what we call um, kidney exchanges in long chains, which can extend up to 20, 30 transplants. And there's a couple of different ways they can go. But um, to give you an outline here, if we have a non-directed donor, this is someone who comes and simply wants to give their kidney, they can donate here to recipient one, the donor for recipient one who was unable to give to them then gives to the next recipient, their donor gives to the next recipient and so on and so on and so on. And as I said, this can, ex this can extend up to 20, 30 transplants across many states. Um, it is a huge logistical organization uh, to set this up. But what is remarkable about this is that in this kind of situation, the whole chain started with one non-directed donor who decided to give a gift. These chains obviously can go ahead if, um, if we don't have a non-directed donor and we simply set them up by um, using many um, pairs who are incompatible. Um, and this is a large part of um, what we try to arrange. So we're very proud to work with the National Kidney Registry and Brigham and Women's Hospital is the New England Center of Excellence uh, for the National Kidney Registry. And this is our, our donor exchange program. This is just a screenshot um, of their website and that I pulled um, the other day. So who are the National Kidney Registry? So this is a nonprofit um, that is based out of Long Island um, in New York and is a national network. This, um, this organization was actually set up by a man whose 10 year old daughter needed a transplant and he was not compatible with her. He wanted to donate and there wasn't a good setup for him to um, get enrolled in an exchange. And it took a long time to get his daughter transplanted. He did eventually donate and she received a kidney, but it was out of that frustration and a desire to do better um, that he went ahead and, and set up this organization. Their mission is to find a well-matched donor within six months. And they place a very significant emphasis on donor safety and procuring very high quality transplants for their recipients. To date, they've facilitated over 4,000 transplants across the country. And they've recently published their data um, in peer reviewed journal that showed they have excellent um, one in five year outcomes based on the fact that because there's such a big organization, they can get quite good matching um, and we can get good kidneys, particularly for patients that are difficult to transplant. So those that can, um, that are more sensitized. So for donors who um, donate through the National Kidney Registry, um, so we enroll all our donors through the National Kidney Registry, all our um, 
exchange donors into the National Kidney Registry at the Brigham. And there are a number of significant benefits um, to donors for doing this. And Dr. Adler previously alluded to some of the barriers to donation so that, you know, it does actually, unfortunately, it can often cost donors money to donate uh, because they can't work, because they have travel expenses. So the NKR has a program to try to mitigate these issues. So they provide lost wage reimbursement for up to four weeks. There's travel and lodging reimbursement. They provide life insurance and disability insurance related to the donation process. And there's also coverage for uncovered complications related to donation. So what does that mean? So, uh, so when someone donates a kidney, the recipient's insurance takes care of their evaluation, their hospitalization and the costs related to that. But occasionally, donors may experience a complication that is not covered under the recipient's insurance. And if that's the situation, you know, we've had circumstances where it wasn't covered under the donor's insurance either, and they've had to pay out of pocket. So the NKR provides insurance to avoid this from happening. So that's a very useful benefit. They also provide legal support. Um, unfortunately, we have seen and there have been reports of donors who have lost their jobs um, while they've been out on leave recovering post-kidney donation. Um, this is illegal, people cannot be fired simply because they've donated a kidney and they're not able to work. And so the NKR provides legal support for those types of situations. So what is advanced donation? This is something that I've, I've mentioned. So advanced donation is where a donor donates their kidney in advance of the recipient being transplanted. So why would you do that? So if I was a parent, um, maybe in my 60s, and I had a child um, who had chronic kidney disease but did not yet need a transplant, I might decide to donate my kidney so that when my child needs a transplant, there essentially is a voucher there for them so that they, they can redeem that voucher and get that kidney. So you provide an, a named recipient um, for the advanced donation um, where that particular person will get that kidney. So again, we see it for parents, we see for spouses. Um, if you know a couple is getting older, one of them may end up on dialysis, they want to um, plan for the future, this is a very useful option. The other thing that people can do that I think is quite a nice benefit is um, what's called a family voucher. So if I choose to be a non-directed donor, because essentially I have no obvious potential recipient. There's no one in my family who looks like they're going to end up on dialysis in the next 5, 10, 15 years. I can donate my kidney and I can name up to five potential recipients who might need a kidney in the future and they can, and one of them can redeem that kidney. Um, so that's called a family voucher. And this doesn't necessarily need to be family. So um, if I had a number of very close friends, I could name them. Um, the NKR um, is quite humane in how they approach this and they look at this on a case by case basis. Again, it's aimed at maximizing the number of kidneys that are available for transplant and providing people with that flexibility that they can care for their loved ones um, in different ways and provide that gift, um, if not directly to the people that they care for, then at least in some way. So in terms of take home points, I've kind of touched on a number of different things, but I just wanted to emphasize a couple of things. So live donor transplant is the best treatment for end stage kidney disease. Our donors are very carefully screened to assess that they are healthy and think about their future risks of disease. There are multiple options for live kidney donation, be it direct donation, through the exchange programs, advanced donation, there are many options and I would encourage you to uh, reach out and contact the program and see what options are maybe suitable for in each individual case. Being enrolled with the National Kidney Registry does increase the chance of getting a successful transplant um, simply because the pool of potential donors is larger. And there are significant protections for live donors provided by the NKR. Um, so again, we are very proud to partner with this organization for our transplant program. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. Um, again, these are the Herrick twins who, um, through their bravery and, and their generous gift, um, started off this whole process here. And uh, hope we do our best and strive to continue that legacy here at the Brigham. Thank you all for your time. Well, thanks, Martina. So um, I'm just going to move on to the 
question and answers uh, session. So, you know, you, you just ended with the Herrick twins and, you know, obviously there were a series of identical twins where one donated to the other. And, you know, um, it's interesting. I mean, I still look after one of those pairs and that transplant is now uh, over 50 years uh, old and both recipient and donor are doing well. So, I mean, it shows what incredible success living donation can be. So, um, so one question is, are there psychological barriers to being a donor? So I think um, these are situations that we assess very carefully. So if someone has a history of psychiatric illness in the past and they're well controlled and not currently symptomatic, the same as any other chronic illness, we look at them and see, are they healthy enough to go through the process? Um, and many patients are. And um, so if someone is uh, currently not well treated and their disease is not under control, we encourage them to go and get treated and then see, um, can they come back? One uh, caveat that we, we do advise all our donors of is that there is um, a slightly increased risk of worsening depressive symptoms after donation um, and that we advise them to monitor for that and follow up with their providers if they experience any symptoms. But psychiatric illness in and of itself is not um, a barrier to being a donor. Facebook on the Brigham Women's uh, sites, if you go to Kidney Crossroads, at, um, if you go to, sorry, if you go to Brigham Women's Hospital's Facebook page, and you look under events, you'll find it under Kidney Crossroads. And that should be, this one should be posted tomorrow or the day after. For those of you who require continuing education credits, uh, uh, you'll need to email kidneycrossroads at bwh.harvard.edu and uh, answer a few questions and you should be able to get credits and that's both uh, for social workers and for nurses. I would of course like to thank our sponsors once again, Novartis, Philoxis, and Sanofi Genzyme for the generous support of this program. And uh, again, if you have any comments, if you have any questions, uh, if you have any suggestions for uh, future uh, uh, topics, we would love uh, to hear from you. And I have been also asked to uh, let you know that the National Kidney Foundation uh, has a renal round table uh, and it's part of the lecture series and it's going to be on genetic testing, making the case for cystic kidney disease uh, by Dr. Nira Dahl, uh, which will be on Tuesday, June the 30th, uh, between four and five. And if you go to the National Kidney Foundation website, you'll be able to register from there. So again, this has been a presentation of the Brigham Women's Hospital's Kidney Crossroads in association with the National Kidney Foundation of New England. Uh, thank you very much.